All right. How's everyone going? Um, just before I get into the word today, just a couple of things that are, are really important that we uh, acknowledge and uh, just see what God is doing in our church. Who came last night to the quiz night? How good was it? It was amazing. Our youth team did an amazing job putting on a quiz night and they've, they've raised over $4,000. So, I don't know, that might pay for kids to go to youth camp for the next year or two, hopefully. But I want to get the youth team up. Juanita's out in kids' church, but Alicia, Hamish and Benito come up here because... Um, it, it was an incredible night. It was one of the, I don't know, for me it was one of the best nights we've had at a church. And uh, was, these guys organised it all themselves. They got the sponsorships, they got the, the vouchers and the gifts and the prizes and they did it all and they were incredible prizes too. And I just wanted to honour them and just say what an amazing job they did. And I just want everyone just to give them a big round of applause. Just to... yeah. it, was, it was truly, even though I didn't win, it was still truly incredible. It was, uh, I thought they could have at least helped the pastor out. But um, there, were, there were forces at work against me. But this, these guys are amazing. They had youth Friday night where they had the young people and they were serving them then they served the church on last night and now they're here again today uh, they deserve uh, a lot of rest and holidays uh, but they're doing an incredible job with the youth group and I just felt it would be great to pray for them today is that all right and we just pray for them and uh, really pray God's hand upon them so why don't you be upstanding and stand I'm gonna ask Steve Bourne to come and lead us in prayer for these guys, because he's young at heart. I wish the body matched. <laughs> Lord, we do rejoice in your goodness, and it's encouraging to see this generation, Lord, is in your hands, and it's in good hands. And we thank you, Lord, you have these faithful servants that, Lord, not only <clears throat> do what needs to be done, but their heart loves you and loves the young uh, young adults that they uh, have been uh, given the privilege and the opportunity to mentor and to serve and to lead and to influence. And Father, we pray collectively and individually for the blessing upon their life and may your name be glorified for all through all that they do. And we give them once again, um, like we do when we dedicate children, we dedicate these leaders to your care and for your kingdom and your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Honestly, our church is in good hands uh, for the future because they did an incredible job, better than what any of us could have done, I reckon. So it's fantastic. Um, God's just been doing some great things in our church. This 40 days of prayer has obviously set some stuff in motion. Uh, Juanita was sharing at the prayer meeting uh, the other day that on Tuesday a lady just walked in our front door and wanted to talk to someone and just ask for prayer and she got the chance to just share with her she came to pop up the next night and she literally said she lives on the peninsula and she drives down Victoria Road week after week after week but for, she said for the last two weeks I drive past your sign and I someone's telling me to come and see you just turn in and come and talk to someone you'll find someone there that can help you and Juanita just happened to be here on a Tuesday where she's normally doing lots of other stuff, but she was here and she was able to pray with her and support her. How amazing is that? It's just incredible. And I'm going to ask Jack Kapikin to come up to share something that happened to him on Wednesday night at Pop-Up, which was just incredible as well. So put your hands together for Jack. Okay. Thank you. How's everyone doing? It's good to see your lovely faces in church today. Yeah, anyway, isn't it so great? Gordon, that was so good. And, you know, like I've, 
I've stepped out with this 40 days. I just want to acknowledge this. That, and God has been doing amazing things. So I had the privilege of uh, coming to pop up this week. And, and uh, so I had a couple of uh, fellas sitting next to me. And um, uh, they just... Man, this is God, man. It's just... Um, it, it, they just started asking me questions, you know. One of the fellows sitting right next to me, he goes, um, so what do we do here? What is this all about, pop-up, he's talking about? And I said, it's about the community. It's, you know, just... And and it's volunteers that um, do all this. And, you know, he, he, he asked another question. He's just asking question after question. And, you know, like, um, yeah, I'm, I was just blown away to... You know, and I'm, you know, just answering his questions, he goes, you know, what's the difference between Catholics and and uh, our church? I, I, you know, I don't know. Like all I, <laughs> all I, uh, what I, I'm saying is it, the main thing is that you believe in Jesus. You know what he done, and you know, and then uh, the his his friend was um, sort of just sitting there quietly at first, and then he, you know, we're talking, and he got involved, and. Um, then uh, his friend asked, asked, uh, he, we, I don't know how it come about we're talking about a Bible, and he asked for a Bible. And uh, I said, oh, I'll see what I can do, you know. And I walked out and asked Juanita, and she brought, in, uh, brought a Bible in, and I had the privilege of giving it to him. And, and signing in, uh, his friend goes, oh, can you please sign in there as well, you know. <laughs> What you you know who it's from and that and oh man it was so good you know, it's so good God is so great yeah and that and and one of those fellas is here today with us yeah. first time first time and that was first time in pop up how good's that just 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 so you know. Sometimes we're praying and praying and we think, what is happening? But God is doing stuff. God is stirring. God is making things happen. And so it's just exciting, isn't it? It's exciting what God has planned. We sang that today, I think. It's only getting started. Who likes Benito's new hairdo? Hey, he looks like my son now, doesn't he? Before he looked like some yobbo off the street, but... With his long hair and he's just look. Oh, he, he got it shaved last night because we, we reached the goal. So that was part of the plan. But I think it looks much nicer. I'm sure his girlfriend doesn't. She's got nothing to rub her fingers through anymore. But, <laughs> but, but it probably won't be there for long anyway. Because if he's going to be anything like me, he's in trouble. It's, uh, anyway, is everyone happy to be in church? All right, let's pray. I think we need to pray. And then we'll uh, get into the word for today. Lord God, we thank you. It's such a privilege and such an honour to be able to stand here and share your word. And I just thank you for this church. I thank you for every member here and even those watching online right now, that you would speak to each of us, Lord God, and that your word would transform our hearts and draw us closer to you. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who remembers last week Emily preached an amazing word? A great word, and, and we're continuing on that theme of deeper and stronger, that we would grow deeper roots in God and strengthen our faith. And so today I want to look a little bit deeper into the, the idea that God's character and nature gives us a framework for how we should live our lives. A few weeks ago I shared about Jesus and how Jesus was an incredible example for us of someone who understood that God's character and nature is literally a compass that guides our lives. And the scripture I used was in John 519 where it says Jesus gave them this answer very truly I tell you the son can do nothing by himself he can only do what he sees his father doing 
because whatever his father does, the son also does. Jesus understood that the father was his source for all things. And he understood that his purpose was to do only what he saw the father doing. So in other words, his purpose was to imitate God's nature and character. So by his example, by Jesus' example, he shows us how we are to live our lives. Because our purpose, the Bible tells us, is that we would be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus. So what does that mean? Literally it means what it says in our vision statement as a church, that we would live like Jesus lived. 1 John 2, 9, if you call yourself a Christian, then live your life as Jesus lived. So we're not called to live our life according to our feelings, which we often tend to do, but we're called to live our life by faith in the character and nature of God. Now, Emily said this last week, and she said, the way we see God has a massive impact on how we live our lives. Do you remember that? That the way we see God has a massive impact on how we live our lives. When I was a young boy, I grew up in a church which was very legalistic. And if you did anything, the first thing they said to you is that you're going to hell. That's basically... You, you uh, oh, just to give you a picture of this, I'm not a lady, but if ladies, if ladies wore pants, they were going to hell because ladies were only meant to wear dresses. And so if I went to the movies, I was going to hell. So I grew up with this idea that God was ready to crack me over the head every time I did something wrong. Every time I sinned, I, would, I was thinking God's going to come down and punish me because that's the way I saw God and so the way so I lived life in fear that I was going to hell but this is this is really important because the challenge for us today is that do we see God as he truly reveals himself in his word or do we allow false and untrue images of God to affect the way we practice our faith I'll say that again do we see God God as he truly shows himself in his word or do we allow false and untrue images of God to affect the way we live out our faith because if we're going to have deep roots we need to make sure we see God for who he truly is and today I want to look at one of God's character traits that I believe will help us understand who he really is, and so we understand who we truly are. And this character trait is the character trait of love. And I believe if we understand that God is love, I believe that, that we will not only strengthen our relationship with him, but we will also discover purpose and direction for our lives. Anyone keen to do that? I shared a few weeks ago that Jesus explained how our relationship with him should work. And I shared the scripture from John 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are, remain in me or if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. A bit like what Jesus said when he said, I can do nothing by himself, myself. We can't do anything without God. He is our source for all things. So he sets that parameter. But for us to fully understand the full context of this passage, we need to keep reading on. Because as we read on, we discover that love is the driving force for everything when it comes to our relationship with God. Let's have a look at it. Jesus goes on to say a bit further on, he says, As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. The foundation of our relationship with God, the foundation that we build our relationship with God on is love. Love is the starting point. Love is the ending point. Love is all over it. And so to put it in the terms of what God is saying to us right now is if, if we're going to have deep roots in God, then the root of everything we are and the root of everything that we do needs to be in God's love. And Paul explains this really powerfully in, in Ephesians. Ephesians 3, when he's praying for the church, what does he pray? He says, I pray that you, what does it say? Being rooted and established in love. So what are we rooted in? Love. This is the core of who we are. Established means a foundation. It's like the, so we are rooted and founded in love. And may, that we may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How powerful is this? What are we to be founded in? What should we be driving and getting to know and understand? God's love. God's love is what will bring us to a place where we will understand the fullness of God. This is the Apostle Paul's prayer to, for us, is that we would fully grasp the, the love of God because in it is the fullness of God. And in the fullness of God, we discover all that God has planned us to be. But to understand this love, we need to realize that this love is not like any love that we see around us. It's a different kind of love to any love we will experience in this world. This, this is the love, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, this is a love that exists in the Godhead, in the Trinity, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Remember that? And out of this love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, everything was created. It's because of the love they had between them that they couldn't be contained, and all the world, all the universe, every part of it, as far as you can go... You consider how big science is telling us the universe is. It's all because of God's love. And out of all of that, he chose to also create us. And this love that we're talking about is so unified. They are so committed and so unified together that their purpose will not be stopped. This is exciting for you to hear because in our world, which is so corrupt and broken and fallen and so much rubbish is going on, we need to hear that God's plan, because of the unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it will be completed. He will continue to work until he restores all things back to him. This is God's, because of God's love, that's why that is possible. And this love, the Bible teaches us, will sacrifice everything for the benefit of others in particular for the benefit of us. Now, here's the thing. This love that Jesus taught about was so revolutionary in its time that they literally had to create a new word to, to explain what it was. Because I'm not saying that this love didn't exist before because we know it did. It existed in God. But the, the reality is that when Jesus came, he was the perfect expression of this love. He, in, in human form, he showed us exactly what this love looks like. Jesus showed us through his words and his actions that God is all about love. But the, he, this is the exciting thing. God, Jesus didn't stop there because he then invites us into this love. He invites us to experience this love. He invites us to be a part of this love. And it doesn't stop there because then he encourages us to then show this love to those around us. Greater love has no man than to lay down 
his life for his friend. So this is what he's calling us to, that we would not just experience God's love, but we would then live out God's love to the world around us. That's why, as Jack said, that's why we do pop up. A, a scripture that explains this really well is 1 John 4, verses 7 to 12, where the Apostle John says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. How incredible is that? We read about the fullness of God, receiving the full measure of God's love. Well, then how do we receive that? Is by loving each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Now, this word love all through that passage is this new word I was talking about. So this new word they had to create was a word. Anyone know what it is? Oh, look at that. You're good. Agape. Agape. Now, I've preached about this a lot, but, but I haven't preached about it for a while now. And I really feel when we're talking about getting deeper roots that you can't, can't get deeper roots without talking about agape love. And uh, so I want to revisit it because I really believe that when we understand what agape love truly is, that we discover that we only exist because of agape love and because of agape love, we, we, we exist for agape love, if that makes sense. So what does agape love mean? Well, agape love is defined by William Barclay, and my kids will love this, as unconquerable benevolence. That's a big term, isn't it? A big term. I'm going to explain what that is. So what, what does it mean? Well, basically, a unconquerable benevolence means that no matter what a person may do to me or to us by the way of insult or injury or even humiliation, we will never seek anything but their highest good. How different is that to the way the world operates? If someone treats you bad, you treat them better. Isn't that what a lot of people say? But God's love is not like that. If someone treats you bad, you love them anyway. This type of love requires an action of all our being. You can't love like this uh, just because you want to try. You can only love this way when, when you do it with all your mind, will and emotions, with every part of you. With your, it takes all your physical effort. And, and again, it has nothing to do with our feelings. If you go by your feelings, you would never love by th like this. But this love describes a deliberate effort which at the end of the day we can only do through the help of God. There's no other way we'll do this. And uh, to sum it up, if I give you a definition just quickly, unconquerable benevolence means no matter what people do to me, I will show them kindness and unsurpassable value. What does that mean? Every person is created in the image of God. And so every person has value. Every person is fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And so our responsibility is to treat them accordingly. A, a really great story I, I learned when I was growing up. Has anyone heard of the story of, or the book, The Cross and the Switchblade? It's a story of a young pastor in the 1950s in America who was pastoring a church in suburban America, middle class 
white America. And he watched the news one day and he saw these gang members um, causing havoc in New York uh, and, and just crazy stuff going on. And he felt God say to him, go and minister to them, go and show them God's love. And so he went to New York and uh, left his church and went to New York. His name was David Wilkinson. And in the early days while he was there, there was a, a notorious gang leader by the name of Nicky Cruz. And he was known all over. And one day David Wilkinson met Nicky Cruz. And Nicky Cruz, literal words to him is, if you come near me, I will kill you. And this is what, if you want to know what agape love looks like, this is David Wilkinson's response to Nicky Cruz was, yeah, you could do that. You could cut me up into a thousand pieces and lay them in the street right here in front of us. And I want you to know that every piece will still love you. That's agape love. Agape love is a love that says, I will love you and show that you are of value and worth no matter how you might treat me because that's the way God loves us. So to give you some practical ideas of what agape love looks like, the first thing we need to understand is that agape love is unlimited. John 3.16, we know, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So God has no favourites. God loves the whole world. He loves all of the world. It doesn't matter what race you are, what gender you are. It doesn't matter what background you come from, rich, poor, or anything in between. God loves us all equally. God loves all the world. He sent his son for all the world. All of us. Everyone. And this is the encouragement for us is that If God loves all the world, then so should we. This is what agape love looks like, unconquerable benevolence. As we know, it's unconditional. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So think about that first statement I made. It's unlimited. I, I... I forgot to say this as well, that he loves sinners and Christians the same. Think about that. Sometimes we think God loves us as Christians, but he hates those dirty old sinners out there in the world. It's not what it's like. This verse, this next passage shows us that it's unconditional. That, But God demonstrates his love for us. When does he do that? While we were still sinners, he died for us. Why would God change his mind once we become Christians? He still loves sinners no matter what. And this is really important for us to understand because in our social structures and society today, we live in a performance-based society. Isn't that true? That you are valued if you achieve great things. If you're... You know, I won't say any football analogies because both the teams were terrible this weekend. But, but the reality, if you're, if you're flying high and you're doing great, you're earning lots of money or, or you're achieving and you're ach- achieving great things or you, you look beautiful and you look amazing like me, you know, so incredible or like Benito with that amazing haircut. When, when you're a trendsetter and you, you just look... You look picture perfect and your Instagram is just about so many good things and you filter it all so it looks great. But but if you look great, then people put you up on a pedestal and say, oh, look at that person. You don't know what their life is like. But we think, oh, they look great, so they must be great. But this this is the thing. God wants us to know that he does not operate on this performance based mentality. He sees us all the same. He loves us all the same. So whether you are uh, the lowest of the low or the highest of the high in the world's terms, he still loves you. And what an incredible challenge for us as a church that we would not base our love for someone on their behaviour or their 
righteousness or their goodness, but we would base our love for them on the character and nature of God, who is love, who gives them unconditional love no matter how they behave. How incredible is that? This is what God's called us to. The last thing I want to share about agape love is that it's forgiving. And this is where we really see the expression of agape love in action, in the act of forgiveness. You don't know what God's kind of love is until you have to forgive someone who has really hurt you. Jesus showed us this example so powerfully in Luke 23, verse 34, when he was on the cross and he said those powerful words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is God's love at its very best. This is what agape love is all about. This is unconquerable benevolence. Jesus didn't just talk about loving your enemies, he actually did it. While he was on that cross and people subjected him to all sorts of inexpressible pain and agony, his action of forgiveness on the cross showed us what real love looks like. You see, Jesus taught passionately about forgiveness all his life. There was parables and all sorts of times he talked about how we should forgive 70 times 7. The parable of the, the, the unforgiving servant and many more. But at that moment, with these words on the cross, Jesus moved from just talking about forgiveness to actually doing it. And at that moment, he gained full credibility with anyone who knew him. Because he didn't just talk about it, he actually did it. Jesus showed us in that action that when we love through forgiveness, we actually experience spiritual maturity. That's when we deepen our roots. If you want to deepen your roots, there's no greater way to deepen your roots than to learn to forgive those who hurt you and those who have done wrong to you. Martin Luther King says it like this, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. So in closing, last week Emily shared from 1 Corinthians 13, which is probably the greatest description of what agape love is all about unconquerable benevolence what it looks like and it says there love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud it does not dishonor others it is not self-seeking it is not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth it always protects always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, it says. Now we explained last week, or Emily explained, that you could simply put God's name in there if you want to know what God's character is, because God's character is love. So God is patient. God is kind. We know that. And, and so you could go through all of that. And then... If we are going to be his children, then it makes sense that as his children, we look like and imitate our father. And so we could even then, if we wanted to say, what do you want us to look like, God? How do you want us to be? Well, then he would say, then put your name there, which is a challenge in itself, that Ben is patient. Sometimes. Ben is kind. Ben does not envy. Ben does not boast. Well, we already failed at that today. <laughs> ben is not proud. Just think of that, of saying that to yourself. Is that what you look like? It's really interesting that there's another verse in the Bible in Galatians 5 where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And then it goes on, joy, patience, kindness, all these things. And I read a really interesting thing that Martin Luther explained about this passage in Galatians 5 and he related it back to 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, 
for us to understand that if we are going to have the fruits of the Spirit, what are the fruits of the Spirit? They're the, they're the fruit of us walking in the Spirit. So if we're going to have that, we also need to understand what it means in relation to, to 1 Corinthians 13. So this is what Martin Luther said, the founder of, of um, the... Oh, my mind's gone blank. Reformation, there we go. That gives us uh, the Protestant side of Christianity. But he said, it might, when he's talking about Galatians 5, he says, it might have been enough to have said love and no more. For love extends itself into all the fruits of the Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul attributes to love all the fruits which are done in the Spirit. When he says love is patient, love is courteous, etc., etc. Notwithstanding, he would set it here by itself among the rest of the fruits of the Spirit. And in the first place, thereby to admonish the Christians that before all things they should love one another, giving honour one to another through love. Every man esteeming better of another than of himself because they have Christ and the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. This term of the the term fruit reminds us of the scripture in John 15, doesn't it? That Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. If we are to deepen our roots in this love that God has called us to be established in, we can only do it by spending time abiding with God, spending time in His presence, spending time knowing Him. And I found in John, in the latter part of John, Jesus has a, there's a whole few chapters of Jesus' final prayer. And in John 17, He, he says a prayer and at the end of that prayer, he, he says this prayer for his people, his, his disciples. And then he expands it to the, and all the disciples that will come. So people like you and I. And in that prayer, he prayed that we would experience the same kind of love that he had with his father. This is what he says. Jesus says, as he's talking to the father, he says, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known. And then he says this that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That the love that with which you have loved me may be in them. This was Jesus' hope. This was Jesus' last prayer before he was arrested and then go on to crucify. His prayer was that we his church would experience the same love that was in the Godhead. That we would know that same love and not just know it, but that we would be a living example of that love to the world we live in. That's what his prayer was for us. That we would experience with each other the same love that God has for us. I really believe the only way we can do this is by experiencing God's love firstly for ourselves and then allowing it to be a driving force for everything else in our lives. Just like Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing, that that would be our prayer as well or our commitment that we would only do what we see God doing. What does God do? He loves. I'm just going to ask everyone to bow their heads in prayer. As I said, the only way we can love like this is if we actually know God's love for ourselves. And maybe it's been a long time since you've experienced God's love or known God's love or it's been that highlighted to you 
And I, I just sense that God is drawing us, that if we're going to grow deeper roots in Him, it has to start with love. It has to start by us saying, God, I love you and I need you in my life. And I think then if there's people in this place that you've never experienced God's love in your life, all you need to do is ask him. To say, God, I need your love. I want your love. I'm sorry for not paying attention to your love. But please, let me know your love. And just that simple prayer the Bible teaches us, God responds to. And so if there are people in, that, in the room today and you need that sort of love, I would love to pray with you. I'd love to stand with you and, and pray with you. So even as we, we go on in a moment, but even after the meeting, if you want to come and talk to me and we can stand and pray together, I would love to be able to do that with you. I'd love to talk to you about it and lead you in a prayer that can help you discover God's love. But at the same time, for many of us, we know God's love. Maybe it hasn't been a, a major um, acknowledgement for us, something that we've been making our focus. We've gotten distracted by everything life throws at us. And God is calling us to, to return to his love. In this moment, I'm going to actually ask the band just to lead us in a song. And I'd, I'd invite you to take a moment to respond to God. And maybe it may, means making a fresh commitment to say, God, help me live in your love. Help me love like you love. I'm not doing it as best I can, but help me make that a priority of my life. So as the band leads us, I'd encourage you to step up and, and, and respond to God and say, God, I open my life to you. And I give my life to you afresh and just say, God, help me love like you love. So just as the band plays, I'd invite you in your seats, wherever you are, whether you want to stand or not, but just to take a moment to reach out to him and ask for his help to love that way.